Namaskar. Let's have a look at some of the important judgments for the month of January 2023. First of all, we shall look into the judgment passed in Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. The case is Messrs. Alpine Housing Development Corporation Private Limited versus Ashok S. Thariwal. In this case, respondents file an interim application under Section 34 of the Arbitration Act to present additional evidence. The appellant objected to the interim application seeking permission to adduce evidence because it was not maintainable under the Act. The court dismissing the interim application stated that allowing the respondents to adduce evidence would defeat the purpose of early arbitration proceedings and delay the Section 34 application. Honorable High Court granted the respondents writ petition and overruled the lower court's order, allowing them to present evidence under Section 34 of the Act. The matter was before Honorable Supreme Court, where Honorable Supreme Court considered the issue as to whether the applicant could present evidence to support the public policy ground in an application under Section 34 Arbitration Act. Honorable Supreme Court dismissed the appeal, thereby observing that arbitral award in conflict with the public policy policy of India can be a ground to set aside the award under Section 34, Subsection 2, Clause B of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. Next is the case Messrs. USS Alliance versus the State of Uttar Pradesh and others. In this case, Honorable Supreme Court Observe that looking at the purpose and object behind Section 34, Subsection 3 of the Act, which is to enable the parties to study, examine, understand the award, and thereupon, if the party chooses and is advised, draft and file objections within the time specified, the starting point of the limitation in case of the suomoto correction of the award would be the date on which the correction was made and the corrected award is received by the party. Once the arbitral award has been amended or corrected, it is a corrected award which has to be challenged and not the original award. The original award stands modified and the corrected award must be challenged by filing objections. Next is the case of Hevlet Packard India Sales Private Limited versus Commissioner of Customs Import Nava Sheva passed in Central Ex Excise Tariff Act 1985, in which Honorable Supreme Court observed with regard to the articles or informations contained in Wikipedia and how reliance can be placed upon them or whether the reliance can be placed upon them. It was observed by Honorable Supreme Court that adjudicating authorities, especially Commissioner of Customs, appeal extensively referred to online sources such as Wikipedia to support the conclusions. While we expressly acknowledge the utility of these platforms, which provide free access to knowledge across the globe, but we must also sound a note of caution against using such sources for legal dispute resolution. These sources, despite being a treasure trove of knowledge, are based on a crowd-sourced and user-generated editing model that is not completely dependable in terms of academic veracity and can promote misleading information. The courts and adjudicating authorities should rather make an endeavor to persuade the councils to place reliance on more reliable and authentic sources. Honorable Supreme Court also referred to Commissioner of Customs Bangalore versus Acer India Private Limited. Now coming to the cases from Code of Civil Procedure 1908, the first case is Sanjeev Kumar versus State of Bihar, in which Honorable Supreme Court held that in view of the provisions as contained in Order 41, Rule 5 CPC, unless the appeal is listed and there is an interim order, the mere filing of the appeal would not operate as a stay. In the case of Ajay Dabra versus Pyare Ram and others, in this case, Honorable High Court dismissed the application for condoning the day, delay filed under Section 5 of the Limitation Act 1963 to condone a delay of 254 days to file first appeal on the ground 
that the reason assigned for the condemnation were not sufficient reasons for the condemnation or delay. The only reason assigned for the delay was that he was not having sufficient funds to pay the court fee. It was held by Honorable Supreme Court on an appeal that an appeal has to be filed within the stipulated period prescribed under the law. Belated appeals can only be condoned when sufficient reasons is shown before the court for the delay. The appellant who seeks condonation of delay, therefore, must explain the delay of each day. It is true that the courts should not be pedantic in their approach while condoning the delay. An explanation of each delay day's delay should not be taken literally. But the fact remains that there must be a reasonable explanation for the delay. Being short of sufficient funds to pay court fee is not a reason to condone delay in filing appeal. In such a scenario, an appeal can be filed in terms of Section 149 CPC and thereafter the defects can be removed by paying deficient court fees. A few of the cases from the constitutional law, one of the cases is Baharul Islam and others versus Indian Medical Association and others, wherein it was held by Honorable Epix Court that any variation in the standards of the qualifications required of medical practitioners who render service in rural areas vis-a-vis -vis those rendering services in urban and metropolitan areas is violative of the constitutional value of substantive equality and non-discrimination. While pronouncing a judgment whereby the uh, Assam Rural Health Regulatory Authority Act 2004 was struck down, which permitted the diploma holder the, in medicine and rural health care to treat certain common diseases, perform minor procedures and prescribe certain drugs, thereby setting aside Guwahati High Court order qua the Assam Act on the ground that it was ultra-virus of the Indian Medical Council Act as well as it was unconstitutional also. The next case is KC Cinema, KC Theatre was the state of Jammu and Kashmir and others in which it was held by Honorable Supreme Court that a cinema hall is the private property of the owner of such hall and he is entitled to put such terms and conditions as he deems fit, provided the same are not contrary to public interest or safety. If a viewer enters a movie hall, he or she has to adhere to the rules of the cinema hall owner and it is evidently a matter of commercial decision of the theatre owner. The court therefore set aside the direction of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court which had ordered multiplexes and movie theatres to not to prevent cinema uh, goers from carrying their own food and beverages into movie halls as regards water that all halls ensure that hygienic water is made available. Next is the case of State of Himachal Pradesh and others versus Goyal Bus Service Kullu, in which Honorable Supreme Court held that taxing statutes cannot be tested on the same principles as law affecting the civil rights and lawmakers should be given a greater latitude while testing these legislation. The Honorable Supreme Court set aside July 2007 judgment of Honorable Himachal High Pradesh High Court, which had held Section 3A, Subsection 3 of Himachal Pradesh Motor Vehicle Taxation Amendment Act 1999 as ultra-virus. Another case is Rebden Lepcha and others versus Union of India and another, in which uh, the case of the writ petitioners were, was that the proviso to Section 10 Subsection 26 AAA of the Act 1961, insofar it excludes from the exempted category Sikkimese woman who marries a non Sikkimese after 1st of April 2008 is discriminatory and unconstitutional. Honorable Supreme Court held that excluding Sikkimese women merely because she marries a non Sikkimese after 1st of April 2008 from exemption provision under Section 10. Uh, subsection 26 AAA Income Tax Act is totally discriminatory and thus unconstitutional. Next is the case of Vivek Narayan Sharma versus Union of India, in which Honorable Supreme Court upheld the Center's 2016 decision to demonetize currency notes of rupees 1000 and rupees 500 denomination by a majority of 4 is to 1. In another case of Kaushal Kishore versus State of UP, Honorable Supreme Court held that a fundamental right under Article 19 or 21 can be enforced even against the persons other than the state or its instrumentalities in the majority judgment held in the ratio of 4 is to 1. 
Now coming to the case from Consumer Protection Act 1986, the case is Mrs. Oswal Plastic Industries versus Manager Legal Department NICO. In this case, Oswal Plastic Industries obtained standard fire and special peril policy on 2nd of July 2009. The policy was in effect when a fire destroyed the material stock machinery etc. worth rupees 76 lakh 64,000 lying in the factory on 17th of October 2009. The insurance company surveyor valued the loss at to, uh, at 29 lakh 17,500 rupees for reinstatement and rupees 12 lakh 60,000 for depreciation. Insurance company, however, denied the claim. The Punjab State Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission received a complaint for 76,000 lakh 64,000 plus interest. The State Commission, however, awarded uh, 29 lakh 17,500 rupees with 9% interest from repudiation and rupees 1 lakh compensation and rupees 11,000 litigation expenses based on the surveyor's rep report. Insurance company appealed to NCDRC who accepted the appeal and modified the award to 12 lakh 60,000 with 7% interest and it also reversed rupees 1 lakh compensation order. The matter reached uh, Honorable Supreme Court, where Honorable Supreme Court directed the insurer to pay reinstatement value of the goods damaged and not the de depreciated value because, as per the policy, in case the insurance company is unable to reinstate or re repair because of some municipal or other regulations, it shall be liable to pay such sum as would be requisite to reinstate or repair such property. Accordingly, the appeal filed by the appellant consumer was allowed by the Apex Court, thereby setting aside the order passed by National Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission. The next case is the Chief Engineer Water Resources Department versus Ratan India Private Power Limited through Director uh, from Contract Act 1872, wherein Honorable Supreme Court uh, reiterated the principle of estoppel, thereby observing that signing the agreement and issuing an undertaking would stop the respondent from challenging the levy of rupees one lakh as irrigation restoration uh, charges. Honorable Supreme Court refused to challenge the levy of irrigation restoration charges charges by the water department from a company for supplying water for industrial purposes as per agreement. A few cases from Criminal Procedure Code 1973. One of the cases is Saurav Das versus Union of India and others, in which the petitioner filed a red petition calling the respondents or states to post charge sheets and chalans on government website, which was dismissed by Honorable Supreme Court. Honorable Supreme Court held that the charge sheets are not public documents under Section 74 of the Indian Evidence Act. The copies of the charge sheet and the relevant documents along with the charge sheet do not fall within section 4, subsection 1, clause B of the Right to Information Act. Another case is Bimla Tiwari versus State of Bihar and others, in which Honorable Supreme Court reaffirmed that criminal law cannot be used for arm twisting and money recovery, especially when bail is opposed. The accused here was charged with the commission of offences under section 406 and 420 IPC and also under section 3 and section 4 of Dowry Prohibition Act. Honorable Patna High Court granted the accused pre-arrest bail after one of the accused offered to pay rupees 75,000 to the petitioner. However, Honorable Supreme Court noted that it is unjustified to require anticipatory bail applicants to pay. Honorable Supreme Court also stated that money recovery is mostly civil. The next case is CBI versus T. Gangi Reddy alias Yera Gangi Reddy, in which the question before Honorable Supreme Court was whether the bail granted under the proviso to subsection 2 of section 167 CRPC uh, on account of failure to complete the investigation within the period prescribed there, therein can be cancelled after the presentation of a charge sheet and if yes then what if yes then what would be the consequences It was held in this case that it is observed 
that in a case where an accused is released of default on default bail under section 167 subsection 2 crpc and thereafter on filing of the charge sheet a strong case is made out and on special reasons being made out from the charge sheet that the accused has committed a non bailable crime and considering the grounds set us out in section 437 subsection 5 and section 439 subsection 2 his bail can be cancelled on merits and the courts are not precluded from considering the application for cancellation of bail on merits however mere filing of the charge sheet is not enough but as observed and held here and above on the basis of the charge sheet a strong case is to be made out that the custody that the accused has committed non billable crime and he deserves to be in custody in other cases, just one thing was the state of Chhattisgarh. In this case, the petitioners were sentenced to life imprisonment for the commission of offense under section 147, 148, section 302 read with section 149, section 307 read with section 149 and section 3 subsection 2 clause 5 of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe prevention of corruption act. The jail superintendent received petitions for premature release under section 432 subsection 2 CRPC. The sessions court that convicted the petitioners denied the application to remit the remaining sentence. Aggrieved, the petitioners invoked article 32 of the constitution to order the respondents to resubmit their case to the sentencing court. Honorable Supreme Court in this case reiterated that while considering the application for remission, the court should provide their opinion after taking into consideration the relevant factors that govern the grant of remission as laid down in Laxman Naskar versus Union of India, 2002, Volume 2, SCC 595. The court noted that in Ramchandra's case, the coordinate bunch had considered in detail the requirement of the factors to be considered by the presiding judge while giving opinion under section 432 subsection 2 CRPC and the powers of the appropriate government to suspend or remit sentence under section 432 and 433A of CRPC. These factors include assessing whether the offense affects the society at large, the probability of the crime being repeated, the potential of the convict to commit crime in future, if any fruitful purpose is being served by keeping the convict in prison, and the socio-economic condition of the convict's family. Therefore, Honorable Supreme Court directed the special judge Durg to provide an opinion on the applications of the petitioners afresh, accompanied by adequate reasoning. The petition was accordingly disposed of. Next is cases Guddanalaya Sloopnarayan versus State of Rajasthan. In this case, Guddanalaya Sloopnarayan was convicted by the trial court under section 307, 323, and 341 IPC and was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment and fine of rupees 1 lakh, the default sentence. In appeal before Honorable Rajasthan High Court, Rajasthan High Court suspended the sentence but imposed strict conditions of deposit of fine amounting to rupees 1 lakh along with a surety of rupees 1 lakh and two bail bonds of rupees 50,000 each. Thus, the petitioner approached Honorable Supreme Court challenging the conditions. In this case, it was held by Supreme Court by allowing the appeal that excessive conditions cannot be imposed while granting bail or suspension of sentence. Condition of bail cannot be so onerous that their existence itself tantamount to refusal of bail. Hence, conditions were waived off. Honorable Supreme Court also referred to the case of Manish Bhaseen versus State Government of NCT of Delhi, 2009, Volume 4, SEC 45, Sanjay Chandra versus Central Bureau of Investigation, 2012, Volume 1, Supreme Court Cases 4, and Sandeep Jain versus National Capital Territory of Delhi, 2000, Volume 2, SEC 66. The next case is Deepak Gaba and others was a state of UP. In this case, the complainant invoked sections 405, 420, 471 and 120B. The magistrate ordered the summoning of the accused only under section 406 and not under section 420 and 471 or 120B. The summoning order was challenged before Honorable Allahabad High Court, but the case was dismissed. Honorable Apex Court bench reviewing the complaint and pre-summoning evidence led by the complainant noted that they failed to establish the conditions and incidents of the penal liability set out in section 405, 420, 471 of the IPC as the allegations pertain to alleged breach of contractual obligations. It was held that in this context while quashing the summoning order, the bench observed 
the court must consciously examine the facts to ascertain whether they only constitute a civil wrong as the ingredients of criminal wrong are missing. A conscious application of the said aspect is required by the magistrate as a summoning order has grave consequences of setting criminal proceedings in motion. Even though at the stage of issuing process to the accused, the magistrate is not required to record detailed reason, there should be adequate evidence on record to set the criminal proceedings into motion. Jagjit Singh versus State of Punjab is a circulated judgment passed by Honorable Punjab and Haryana High Court, wherein Honorable Punjab and Haryana High Court passed the directions to the learned courts of judicial magistrates who are required to take the provisions of Section 82 CRPC in its true letter and spirit. It was advised that whenever a proclamation is issued, then two dates be given in the order. That is, first it should be within 15 to 20 days, giving the direction to the serving official to complete the process of proclamation and to return the proclamation well in time and to appear in the court for making statement about publication of proclamation. The second date should be fixed after 30 days thereof, directing the accused to appear at a specific place and on a specified date and time so that there is no violation of provisions of section 82 CRPC. Next case is Employee State Insurance Act 1948 that is the ECA ESI Corporation versus Mrs. Radhika Theater. In this case, the respondent Radhika Theater paid ESI contributions up to September 1989 since the number of employees went below the prescribed number, that is 20, it stopped making contributions. Demand notices were issued by the ES ESI Corporation. The demand notices were challenged before the ES ESI Court, which was dismissed. The matter reached before Honorable Supreme Court, wherein Honorable Supreme Court held that according to Section 1, Subsection 6 of the Employee State Insurance Act 1948, an establishment would be governed by the Act even if the number of employees fell below the specified limit at any time, and the provision would apply to establishments established before the provision came into effect. Another case is from Goa Prison Rules 2006, that is Ravi Dungat was a state of Goa, in which Honorable Supreme Court held that the parole period has to be excluded from the period of sentence under the Goa Prison Rules 2006, while considering 14 years of imprisonment for premature release. Next case is from Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act 1956. The name of the case is Sri Ram Sridhar Chimurkar versus Union of India. In this case, after two years of the death of the husband of the of the lady who was the government employee, the widow adopted a son. His family pension claim was denied because Rule 54, Sub Rule 14, Clause B of the Central Sub Civil Services Pension Rule states that the children adopted by a widow of a government official after the government servant death are not entitled to family pension. The Central Administrative Tribunal, Mumbai, granted his application and ordered the authorities to consider his family pension claim as the adopted son of the deceased government employee. The tribunal noted that Section 8 and Section 12 of the Hindus, Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act 1956 allow the widow of a Hindu male to adopt a son or daughter without her deceased husband's direction. According to the tribunal, a widow's adoption would make the child her deceased husband. Uh, the adopted son petitioned before Honorable Apex Court after Honorable High Court overruled the tribunal's order. The issue raised before Honorable Apex Court was whether a child adopted by a widow of a government servant subsequent to the death of the government servant would be included within the scope of the definition of family under Rule 54 Subrule 14, Clause B of the CCS Pension Rules and would therefore be entitled to receive family pension payable under the said rules. It was held by Honorable Supreme Court that a son or daughter adopted by a widow of a deceased government servant after the death of the government servant cannot be included with the definition of family under Rule 54, Subrule 14, Clause B of the Central Service Pension Rules 1972 to claim family pension. 
One of the cases is from Hindu Succession Act 1956, which is Elumalai Alias Venkatesan versus M. Kamla and others, where an honorable Supreme Court, while dealing with a case relating to the property dispute between the heirs of the property, observed that the transfer by the heir apparent being mere spes succionis is ineffective to convey any right over the property. That is, the chance of succession does not give a valid right. Now coming to the cases under Indian Evidence Act 1872, the first case is Bobby versus State of Kerala. In this case, Bobby and others were convicted for the commission of offenses under section 395, 365, 364, 201, 380, 302, read with section 34 IPC. The, in the appeal, uh, filed by Bobby, it was argued that a memorandum under Section 27 of the Indian Evidence Act is needed for recovery initiated by an accused based on the police statements. It was claimed that no memorandum or signatures of the independent or punch witnesses were taken at the time of Vishwanathan's body recovery. Honorable Supreme Court, while setting aside the concurrent conviction, made the following observations regarding Section 27. It observed that Section 27 of the Indian Evidence Act requires that the fact discovered embraces the place from which the object is produced and the knowledge of the accused as to this, and the information given must relate distinctly to the said fact. The information as to past user or the past history of the object produced is not related to its discovery. The Honorable Supreme Court also relied upon Chandran versus State of Tamil Nadu, 1978, Volume 4, SCC 90, and State of Karnataka versus David Rosario, 2002, Volume 7, Supreme Court Cases, 728, in which IO is duty bound to draw the discovery punch nama as contemplated under Section 27 of the Evidence Act. Honorable Supreme Court also relied upon Subramanya versus State of Karnataka 2022 SEC Online Supreme Court 1400, in which two essential requirements for the application of Section 27 of the Evidence Act were laid down that the person giving information must be an accused of an offence and he must also be in police custody. The court held that the provision of Section 27 of the Evidence Act are based on the view that if a fact is actually discovered in consequences of information given, some guarantee is afforded thereby that the information was true and consequently the said information can safely be allowed to be given in evidence. Honorable Supreme Court also placed reliance upon Suresh Chandra Bahari versus State of Bihar 1995 Supplementary 1 SCC 80. Now coming to Indian Penal Code 1860, the case is Usha Chakravarti and another was the state of West Bengal and another. In this honorable Supreme Court quashed the criminal proceedings after noting that the attempt was to give a clock of criminal offence to a civil dispute. The court noted that the application filed under section 156 subsection 3 CRPC were vague and did not attract the essential ingredients of the offences. Also, the pendency of a civil suit on the issue was suppressed in the application. It was also held that there cannot be any doubt with respect to the position that in order to cause registration of an FIR and consequential investigation based on the same, the petition filed under section 156 subsection 3 CRPC must satisfy the essential ingredients to attract the alleged offences. In other words, if such allegations on the petition are vague and are not specific with respect to the alleged offences, it cannot lead to an order for registration of an FIR, an investigation on the accusation of commission of the offences alleged. Now, another case is Naeem Ahmed versus State and City of Delhi, where an honourable Supreme Court uh, observed that every breach of promise to marry is not rape, thereby acquitting a man who was sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment. Elaborating on the same with regard to the promise to marriage uh, to marry and breach thereon, it was observed by Honorable Supreme Court that it would be a folly to treat each breach of person promise to marry as a false promise and to prosecute a person for the offense of rape under Section 376 IPC. 
difference between giving a false promise and committing breach of promise by the accused. In case of false promise, the accused right from the beginning would not have any intention to marry the prosecutrix and would have cheated or deceited the prosecutrix by giving a false promise to marry her only with a view to satisfy his lust. Whereas in case of breach of promise, one cannot deny a possibility that the accused might have given a promise with all seriousness to marry her and subsequently might have encountered certain circumstances unforeseen by him or the circumstances beyond his control which prevented him to fulfill his promise. Honorable Supreme Court also made certain observations with regard to the recording of testimony of the prosecutrix by the courts. It was observed by Honorable Supreme Court that the evidence of the witness has to be recorded in the language of the court or in the language of the witness as may be practicable and then get it translated in the language of the court for forming a part of the record. However, recording of evidence of the witness in the translated form in English language only Though the witness gives evidence in the language of the court or in his or her own vernacular language is not permissible. The text and tenor of the evidence and the demeanor of the witness in the court could be appreciated in the best manner only when the evidence is recorded in the language of the witness. When a question arises as to what exactly the witness had stated in his or her evidence, it is the original deposition of the witness which has to be taken into account and not the translated memorandum in English prepared by the presiding judge. All courts while recording the evidence of the witnesses shall duly comply with the provisions of section 277 CRPC. Another case is Munna Lal versus State of UP. In this case, Honorable Supreme Court set aside concurrent conviction of murder accused, thereby observing that there is a fair degree of uncertainty in the prosecution story, and the courts below appear to have some what be influenced by the oral testimony of PW2 and PW3 without taking into consideration the effect of other attending circumstances, thereby warranting interference. The judgment also summarized the following settled principles. Section 134 of the Indian Evidence Act 1872 enshrines the well-recognized maxim that evidence has to be weighed and not counted. In other words, it is the equality of the evidence that matters and not the quantity. As a sequitur, even in a case of murder, it is not necessary to insist upon a plurality of witnesses and the oral evidence of a single witness. If found to be reliable and trustworthy, could lead to a conviction. Generally speaking, oral testimony may be classified into three categories, that is wholly reliable, wholly unreliable, neither wholly reliable nor wholly unreliable. The first two categories of cases may not pose serious difficulty for the court in arriving at its conclusion. However, in the third category of cases, the court has to be circumspect and look for corroboration of any material particulars by reliable testimony, direct or circumstantial, as a requirement of the rule of prudence. A defective investigation is not always fatal to the prosecution where ocular testimony is found credible and cogent, while in such a case, the court has to be circumspect in evaluating the evidence. A faulty investigation cannot in all cases be a determinative factor to throw out a credible prosecution version. Non-examination of the investigating officer must result in prejudice to the accused. If no prejudice is caused, mere non-examination would not render the prosecution case fatal. Discrepancies do creep in when a witness deposes in a natural manner after lapse of some time, and if such discrepancies are comparatively of a minor nature and do not go to the root of the prosecution story, then the same may not be given undue importance. Next case is Prasad Pradhan versus State of Chhattisgarh. In this case, the appellants attacked the deceased while he was having his hand leveled by a JCB machine. The post-mortem report said head trauma killed the deceased. The suspects were charged under Section 302 Red Way 34 IPC. The trial court convicted the accused and sentenced them to life imprisonment and six months of rigorous imprisonment for the offence under Section 323 of IPC. Honorable Chhattisgarh High Court partly allowed their appeal but upheld their conviction and punishment. Thus, the matter was before Honorable Supreme Court. Honorable Supreme Court had to decide if the appellants committed murder under Section 302 or under Section 304 IPC. 
Honorable Supreme Court upheld the conviction and sentence of the accused who were involved in killing a 55 year old man. The court, while considering the principle of sudden and grave provocation, stated that there was no sudden quarrel between the accused and the deceased. The court also relied upon K.M. Nanavati versus the State of Maharashtra, 1962, SCR Supplementary, Volume 1, 567 wherein the standard of reasonableness for applying the grave and sudden provocation was explained. What is evident is that while there were pre-existing disputes of some vintage between the appellants and the deceased, there is nothing to show that they had been aggravated. It was also likewise not clear whether the deceased said anything to the appellants, which triggered their ear, leading to loss of self-control to the result in grave and sudden provocation. Next case is Jasbir Singh versus State of Punjab, in which Supreme Court converted the conviction for from Section 302 IPC to Part 1, Section 304 IPC. While well, the conviction under Section 307 IPC was not interfered with, with appeal filed by the appellant against the judgment of conviction by Punjab and Haryana High Court on the ground of self-defense, it was observed by Honorable Supreme Court that it cannot be said that a person alarmed by aggression by 30 to 35 persons and that too armed with lattes would not use firearm in the self-defense. Next case is John Anthony Sami alias John was a state representative by the inspector of police. In this case, Honorable Supreme Court upheld the murder conviction of a man who was accused of killing a taxi driver. Honorable Supreme Court, while dismissing an appeal filed by the accused, held that the prosecution had established and proved that the deceased was killed after her his car was stolen by the accused. The accused was convicted under Section 302 and 201 IPC by Honorable Madras High Court. The accused was involved in murdering the driver of a taxi through a conspiracy by taking him to an isolated place, killing him and stealing the car and other personal belongings owned by the deceased and burying his dead body. It was the case on behalf of the accused that he was convicted on the confessional statement and therefore, in case of circumstantial evidence and unless and until the complete chain of events were proved and established, he could not have been convicted on a conventional a confessional statement. The next case is Jabir versus State of Uttarakhand. In this case, Haseen, a seven-year-old boy, was found dead in a sugarcane field in village Narayanpur on October 10, 1999. The trial court sentenced the appellates to life for murdering the boy. Honorable High Court confirmed the sent sentence. The matter reached before Honorable Supreme Court. Honorable Supreme Court, while setting aside the conviction of the murder, accused observed that the last in theory cannot be the sole basis for conviction as it had limited application, where the time lag between the time the deceased was last seen with the accused and the time of the murder was narrow. The Apex Court noted that the conviction was solely based on the last seen theory, that is the testimonies of the prosecution witnesses, who claimed that they had seen the deceased last with the appellant accused on 9th of October 1999, a day after the deceased went missing, and observed that the witnesses, despite noticing the deceased in the company of the two accused, and despite having heard a cry from the deceased, did not look back. X was the state of Uttar Pradesh and others is the case in which appeal was filed against Honorable Allahabad High Court order that quashed criminal proceedings observing that the complaint lodged against the husband demand of diary, uh, dowry is inherently improbable and it falls in the category of bogus prosecution. However, it was the appeal was allowed so filed by Honorable Apex Court with observation that merely because the wife was suffering from the disease AIDS and or divorce petition was pending, it cannot be said that the allegations of demand of dowry were highly or inherently improbable. Once the charge sheet was filed after the investigation having been found prima facie case, it cannot be said that the prosecution was bogus. A few of the cases from Land Acquisition Act 1894 and Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency and Land Acquisition Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act 2013. One of the cases is Manubhai Sindhabhai Bharwad and another versus Oil and Natural Gas Corporation Limited and others in which Honorable Supreme Court observed that temporary acquisition of land cannot be continued for 20 to 25 years. And if such acquisition continued for a number of years, 
the meaning and purpose of temporary acquisition would lose its significance. Honorable Supreme Court observed that to continue with a temporary acquisition for a number of years would be arbitrary and can be said to be infringing the right to use the property guaranteed under Article 300A of the Constitution of India. It further added that even to continue with a temporary acquisition for a longer period, can be said to be unreasonable, infringing the rights of the landowners to deal with and or use the land. Another case is Mahanadi Coal Fields Limited versus State of Odisha and others. In this case, the land in question were owned by the state government of Odisha and were acquired by the central government of India under Section 9 of the Coal Bearing Area. Acquisition and Development Act 1957, the central government directed that the said lands and rights should be vested in the government company. Notice was issued by the respondent states demanding a sum of rupees 70 lakhs towards premium for government land and rupees 40 lakhs towards compensation. These demand notices were challenged by the appellant by way of writ petition before Honorable High Court. Honorable High Court observed that the state co government was a person interested in land and therefore entitled to compensation over and above in lieu of losing the rights over the land. The matter went to the Supreme Court, wherein Honorable Supreme Court held that the state government being the original owner was a deemed lesser and was the person interested entitled to compensation and surface land rent from the government company in whom the rent rights under the mining lease were vested by the central government. Then is the case of government of NCT of Delhi versus Ratiram and another in which Honorable Supreme Court reiterated that the land acquisition proceedings shall not lapse if the award is not made as of the right to compensation to fair compensation transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2013. The Supreme Court decided 13 such land acquisition cases. Similarly, is the case of Delhi Development Authority versus Manpreet Singh and others, in which the Honorable Supreme Court, while deciding two appeals together, had set aside the order of Honorable Delhi High Court, in which it was held that the acquisition of the land was deemed to have lapsed by virtue of Section 24, Subsection 2 of the Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and, Re and Resettlement Act 2013. Honorable Supreme Court disagreed with Honorable High Court on the ground that the relevant conditions were not satisfied to declare the aforesaid order. In this case, the respondents being the subsequent purchaser acquired the right title or interest in the land in the year 2018. They were not the recorded owner at the time when the award with respect to the land in question under the provisions of the Land Acquisition Act 1894 was issued. The respondents claimed the right title or interest based on the assignment deed of 2015. Honorable High Court allowed the petition of the respondents holding that the acquisition of land was deemed to have lapsed. Similarly is the case of Delhi Development Authority versus Eminent Marketing Private Limited. And also Delhi Development Authority versus Bina Gupta through Ellas and others. Another case is State of Haryana and others was a Sashila in which Honorable Punjab and Haryana High Court had allowed the writ petition and declared the acquisition of the land in question and ha uh, in question had lapsed under Section 24, Subsection 2 of the Act of 2013. The appeal was preferred before Honorable Supreme Court against the judgment in which it was held by Supreme Court that the encroachers cannot take advantage of Section 24, Subsection 2 of the Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency and Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act 2013 to challenge the land acquisitions because it would promote illegality, which was not the legislature's intent. Honorable Apex Court further observed that the respondents had no locus tendi to challenge the acquisition or lapsing of acquisition and placed reliance on the decision of the Apex Court. In the case of Delhi administration through Secretary Land and Building versus Pavan Kumar and others, and accordingly the appeal was allowed by Honorable uh, Supreme Court. The next case is Government of NCT of Delhi versus Bhagrati. In this case, the case of the appellants was that the appellant and other original respondents uh, argued that the award was declared on 19th of June 1992 and the actual vacant possession of the subject land was taken on 21st of March 2007 
out of which the original writ petitioner were, was claiming one by 12th part. The appellant claimed that DDA gained possession after conducting on-site possession proceedings. The appellant LSE also argued that the initial writ petitioner is not the recorded owner uh, and that the recorded owner never claimed compensation, leaving it unpaid. Despite the above and even after observing that the land in a question was taken over. Honorable Delhi High Court in its order passed, however, held that in keeping the question of title of the subject land open to be decided in the appropriate court of jurisdiction had declared the acquisition with respect to the land in question is deemed to have occurred. Honorable Supreme Court setting aside the order passed by Honorable Delhi High Court held that the title with respect to the land in question in favor of the original writ petitioners was yet to be established. The original writ petitioner was not a recorded owner. The recorded owner never came forward to receive the compensation and therefore the same was lying unpaid. Therefore, unless and until the right and title of the original writ petitioner was established, the High Court had materially erred in entertaining the writ petition. Honorable Supreme Court reiterated that the land acquisition shall not lapse if the award is not made as on the commencement of the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2013. Next case is government of NCT Delhi versus Sunil Jain in which it was held by Honorable Supreme Court that delay in taking possession of land because of a pending litigation does not entitle the original owner of the land. The benefit of lapse under Section 24, subsection 2 of the right to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act 2013. Honorable Supreme Court also held that the original petitioners being the subsequent purchasers, uh, purchasers is concerned. The said issue is now at is now not res integra in view of the decision of three judges bench of the court in the case of Shiv Kumar and other versus Union of India 2019 volume 10 SCC 229 when Honorable Supreme Court has specifically observed and held that the subsequent purchaser has no locus to challenge the acquisition or lapsing of the acquisition. Now coming uh, to the case from uh, Negotiable Instrument Act 1889, the case is Rajaram, son of Srira Mullu Naidu, son deceased through Ellas versus Maruthachalam, son deceased through Ellas. In this case, arising out of the check pounds complaint, the accused was acquitted by the trial court. Honorable High Court reversed the acquittal and convicted the accused in appeal. Honorable Apex Court noted that the accused has examined the income tax officer who produced certified copy of the income tax returns of the complainant for the relevant financial year to show that the complainant had not declared that he had lent rupees 3 lakhs to the accused and that the complainant did not have financial capacity to the money as alleged. It was held by Honorable Supreme Court that the standard of proof for rebutting the presumption is that of preponderance of probabilities. Once the execution of the check is admitted, Section 139 of the Negotiable Instrument Act mandates a presumption that the check was for the discharge of any debt or other liability. The presumption under Section 139 is a rebuttable presumption and the onus is on the accused to raise the probable defense. The standard of proof for rebutting the presumption is that of the preponderance of probabilities. To rebut the presumption, it is open for the accused to rely on the evidence led by him or the accused can also rely on the material submitted by the complainant in order to raise a probable defense. Interference of inference of preponderance of probabilities can be drawn not only from the material brought on record by the party, but also by reference to the circumstances upon which they rely. Honorable Supreme Court also referred to Basi Langappa versus Mudib. Basapa 2019, Volume 5, Supreme Court Cases 418. A few of the cases from service jurisprudence. One is Sushil Pandey and another was the State of UP through Principal Secretary Home and others. The general principle of service jurisprudence that seniority is required to be computed from the date of actual entry into a particular cadre cannot operate in a case where there is an undisturbed judicial finding that the appointments were made on different dates in breach of the applicable rules. The appeal questioned the legality of the selection list for post of assistant radio officers in the Uttar Pradesh Police Radio Department. 
Next is the case of ex-constable driver Mukesh Kumar Raigad versus Union of India and others. In this case, the petitioner appointed as constable received a notice on me or memorandum of charge under Rule 36 of CISF Rules 2001 from the Office of Commandant Discipline CISF alleging that he had suppressed the fact that he was involved in a criminal case for the offence under Section 323, 324, and 341 IPC, for which a FIR was registered against him at the time of submitting his corrector certificate. The petitioner confessed during disciplinary proceedings, the commandant disciplined CISF, keeping in view the young age and future prospects of the petitioner, imposed punishment of reduction to pay. However, the departmental inquiry culminated in the removal of the petitioner from service. The single bench of the High Court set aside the order of his removal, but thereafter, the division bench allowed the appeal of the CISF authorities. It was held by Supreme Court while dismissing the special leave petition, thereby also upholding the order of the division bench of Honorable Rajasthan High Court, in which it allowed the appeal of the authorities removing a constable from the service that the CISF, that is Central Industrial Security Force authorities, had removed the petitioner from the service after following a due process of law. The bench noted that when an inquiry is conducted on the charges of a misconduct by a public servant, the court or tribunal would be concerned only to the extent of determining whether the inquiry was held by a competent officer or whether the rules of natural justice and statutory rules were complied with. The next case is Union of India versus Rajiv Khan and others. The question before Honorable Supreme Court was whether in a case where the educational qualification for the post of nursing assistant and staff nurse are different, still the nursing assistant shall be entitled to the nursing allowance at par with staff nurses. It was held by Honorable Supreme Court that the case of nursing assistants cannot be compared with the staff nurses as both carry different educational qualification. Different educational qualification and experience prescribed for employment can be a ground to have different pay scales or pay structures. Reliance was placed upon Secretary Department of Personal Public Grievance and Pension and another versus TVL and Malika Arjuna Rao, 2015, Volume 3, SCC 653, Director of Elementary Education, Risa and others versus Pramod Kumar Sahu, 2019, Volume 10, SCC 674, and Punjab State Cooperative Milk Producers Federation Limited and another versus Balbir Kumar Walia and others, 2021, Volume 8, SCC 784. Now coming to Surfacey Act 2002, the first case is K. Sridhar versus M. Rouse Construction Private Limited, in which it was held by Supreme Court that once secured property is put as a security by way of mortgage, the same will not be treated as an agricultural land and the burden is upon the borrower to prove that the secured properties are agricultural land and are being used as agricultural land and or agricultural activities are going on. Another case is Kotak Mahindra Bank Limited versus Gidnar Corrugators Private Limited, in which Honorable Supreme Court observed that dues under Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Development Act 2006 would not prevail over Surfacey Act. With regard to the interpretation of the statute, it was held that if the legislature confers the latest enactment with a non obstanding clause, it means the legislature wanted the subsequent or later enactment to prevail. Next case is Mrs. Siddha Neelkant paper, Industries Private Limited and other versus Prudent ARC Limited and other, in which the borrower has to deposit 50% of the amount of debt due as claimed by bank or financial institution or assignee along with interest as claimed in the notice under section 13 subsection 2 of the Surfacey Act as observed by Honorable Supreme Court. It was also held that the borrower cannot claim adjustment or appropriation of the amount realized by selling the secured properties and deposited by the auction purchaser when the auction sale is also under challenge. Next case is Baswaraj versus Padmavati and other, in which Honorable Supreme Court held that the proceeding under the Securitization and Reconstruction of Financial Assets and Enforcement of Security Interest Act 2002 burden was upon the borrowers to prove that the secured properties were agricultural lands and were being used as agricultural lands and were thus exempted under Section 31 small i of Surfacey Act. 
Then is the case from scheduled caste and scheduled tribe prevention of atrocities act 1989. The cases are Venkata Severan and others versus P. Bhakta Vichalam. In this case, Honorable Apex Court, while quashing the proceedings against the accused under Section 3, Subsection 1, Clause 5, and Clause 5A of SC and ST Act 1989, observed that the proceedings were abuse of the process of law as. A private dispute, dispute was going on between the parties with respect to the illegal construction. There are no allegations that the complainant is obstructed and or interfered with enjoyment of his right on his property deliberately and willfully knowing that the complainant belongs to SCST. Now, last of uh, the cases is from uh, Specific Relief Act 1963. The first case is Manik Majumdar and others was a Deepak Kumar Saha dead through LRs and others. In this case, a split verdict in a plea pertaining to the issue that when a sale deed is executed on the strength of a deed of power of attorney, the non-production of the deed of power of attorney uh, in a suit is fatal to the case of the plaintiff was there. The judgment was passed by a bench comprising of Honorable Mr. Justice M. R. Shah and Honorable Madam Justice B. V. Nagaratna. While Justice Shah uh, took note of the fact that the plaintiff had not produced the deed of power of attorney, Honorable Justice Nagaratna was of the opinion that the non-production was not fatal to the case of the plaintiff. In view of the difference of opinion in the matter, the registry was directed to place the papers before Honorable the Chief Justice of India for appropriate orders for constituting a larger bench to decide the controversy. Next case is uh, C. Haridasan versus Anapat. Parakatu, Vasudeva group and others. In this case, there was a suit for specific performance of agreement to sell on the Honorable Supreme Court bench comprising of Mr. Justice M. R. Shah and Madam Justice B. V. Nagarutna delivered a split verdict on whether the plaintiff is entitled to the decree of specific relief or not. In view of the differences of the opinion in the matter, register was was directed to place the papers before Honorable the Chief Justice of India for appropriate orders for constituting a larger bench to decide the controversy. Next case is Baswaraj versus Padmavati. In this case, the appellant before Honorable Supreme Court sought to enforce the agreement in question. On the other hand, respondent alleged that the agreement had not been executed and further that the appellant had not been ready or willing to carry out the sale. The trial court had earlier issued a decree of specific performance in favor of the appellant. However, Karnataka High Court reversed the trial court order on the ground that the appellant had not proved that he had sufficient funds or means to pay the balance sale consideration for the property sale. Pertinently, the High Court arrived at this finding in view of the fact that the appellant had not produced his passport. Honorable Supreme Court observed that no adverse inference can be drawn against a party on whether he is ready and willing to perform his side of an agreement to buy property merely for not producing his passport. The court noted that further, unless the appellant was called upon to produce the passport either by the opposing party or on the court's order, no in adverse interference can be inference can be drawn against him for non-production of his passport. Judgments and orders passed by the High Court were hereby quashed and set aside. The judgment and decree passed by the trial court for specific performance of the agreement to sell dated 13th of March 2007 was hereby restored. The last case is Smriti Debarama dead through legal representative versus Prabha Ranjan Debarama and others. In this case, an attorney on behalf of Maharani Chandra Ratra Devi had filed a suit praying for declaration that she is the owner of the property known as Khosh Mahal. Maharani Chandra Ratra Devi was the sixth wife of the late Maharaja Birendra Kishore Debarama and was not survived by her children who had predeceased her. She expired soon after the filing of the said suit and therefore the appellant had inherited the Schedule A property and other properties in terms of the will. However, the appellant also expired during the pendency of the appeal and was now represented by her legal representatives. The respondents and their agents were restrained from entering the property and creating any sort of disturbance in the peaceful possession. It was held that in terms of Section 102 of the Indian Evidence Act, if both parties fail to adduce evidence, the suit must fail. Onus of proof 
no doubt shifts and the shifting is a continuous process in the evolution of the evaluation of the evidence. But this happens when a suit for title and possession, the plaintiff has been able to create a high degree of probability to shift the onus on the respondent. In the absence of such evidence, the burden of proof lies on the plaintiff and can be discharged only when he is able to prove title. The weakness of the defense cannot be a justification to decree the suit. In the present case, the plaintiff has not been able to establish her right or title and ownership over the scheduled A property. A decree of position cannot be passed in favor of the plaintiff on the ground that the respondents have not been able to fully establish their right, title, or interest in scheduled A property. Thus, it held that the impugned judgment by the High Court had rightly allowed the appeal and set aside the judgment and decree of the trial court. So, this is all about the important judgments passed by the courts for the January 2023. Till we meet again, Namaskar.